Thank you guys so much again for, for being here with us. We have had a great week. I have uh, been recharged by the fellowship, by great preaching, and just the opportunity to be able to more than once a week or twice a week just get away from the world and just be with the brethren. And that's, that's what it's all about. What a wonderful opportunity we have. We're so grateful for all the folks that have come out and visited with us uh, over the last few nights. And uh, this, uh, this effort's been well, I think, supported. Um, and it's been a, it's been a great great opportunity to be together. Got to, to be able to meet uh, James and Stewart, and uh, I tell you, I'm thankful. He's a great guy, wonderful preacher. We're so thankful for him and for his family. And uh, we're gonna have our last night tonight. Brother Blake Lee's gonna be leading us singing. Um, after the first, uh, after a couple songs, we're gonna ask uh, Brother Roy Taylor from the Bethel Congregation to have an opening prayer. Brother Jason Hutchison will have a closing prayer at the appropriate time. Are there any announcements uh, from areas that, that we need to make mention of? We <coughs> um, Ayuka, we're going to post this. Um, Ayuka, beginning May the 16th, is going to be having a gospel meeting. It is um, in the parking lot, uh, beginning 10 o'clock Sunday morning. It's going to go through uh, Thursday night. Uh, Monday through Thursday, 7 o'clock p.m. It says make sure you bring your lawn chairs. Um, and so that's going on. Um, Maud Congregation, Maud, Alabama, is having a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday meeting. And that's uh, that's this week. So we, uh, please be praying about those gospel efforts uh, uh, there and, and uh, throughout the areas. Appreciate it so much again you being here. And if you have any more announcements, things that need to be uh, mentioned, let us know. We'll try to get those things mentioned before we dismiss this. Seven hundred forty-four. <clears throat> Seven hundred forty-four. <clears throat> we'll say first and third. Ready? I'm in the way of bright shining way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus reigns today. Yes, I'm in the glory land, glory land. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. I'm in
this time mark your song books to 453. 453, I'm just going to be the song of the eternity to see. Our dear and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the blessings of life. We thank you for each one that's resting here tonight. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the speaker there, the way that the word is in prayer. At this time, good ready. We will take into our hearts and study. If to be the truth, we will live these out in our everyday lives and spread them to a lost and to a dying generation. Pray, Heavenly Father, for those of this congregation as well as others who are sick and afflicted. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you bless the means that's being used to treat them so that they might once again be able to come back and be with their families. Pray now, Heavenly Father, as we continue this service, be reach of us, God us, guide us, direct us through your word, for what you do this Christ's name we pray. Amen. It is good to see everyone again this evening. Glad we can be here together and study God's Word with each other again tonight. I thank you so much for all that you have done for us this week. You fed us, you, you've taken care of us, you've encouraged us this week, and hopefully we have been an encouragement to you. It's been good getting to know you, uh, good getting to sit down and eat with, with several of you, and, and we do appreciate getting to know you. And going forward, I know that y'all will do pulling together, serving the Lord. Y'all will do great things together, as you already have been doing. Continue that good work for the Lord, and He will be pleased. This week, in the theme that we've been thinking about, we're better together. We've been in the book of Daniel, and we've been thinking about how that even, even during difficult circumstances, even during trying times, we are better together. Uh, we think about there's been times over the past year or two where we've been apart more than we would have liked to have been, and now what an encouragement it is to finally be able to be back together. In Daniel chapter 1, we were reminded that we're better together when our identity is found in God. Daniel chapter 2 reminded us that we are better together when we trust God's wisdom and God's power over man's wisdom and man's power. In Daniel 3, we saw we're better together when we are willing to suffer so that God's power can be exalted. In Daniel 4, we're better together when we recognize God's sovereignty and we live our lives according to the fact that God rules in the kingdoms of men. And then last night, we observe that we are better together when we live this life keeping the judgment in mind. We live this life prepared to face God's judgment whenever that day may be. Tonight, in Daniel chapter 6, probably the most well-known of all these chapters, we're talking about Daniel and the lion's den tonight. And here in Daniel chapter 6, we're going to think about that we are better together when we are a people who are devoted to prayer. We're better together when we are a people who are devoted to prayer. In Daniel chapter 6, when we started this in Daniel 1, Daniel was a very young man, as we talked about perhaps as young as 16 years old, a teenager most likely. Now, Daniel has been in Babylon a long time. In fact, the Babylonian Empire has fallen, and now there's a totally new empire in command, the, the Medes and the Persians, and Daniel is still serving. Daniel's a much older man at this point, perhaps even in his 80s or approaching even maybe his 90s. A much older individual. He has been through a lot, and he has remained faithful to God through it all. And here in Daniel chapter 6, the first nine verses, we're going to see that Daniel was known. Daniel was well known as a man of prayer. It pleased Darius, beginning in verse 1, the king, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, or, or these are basically, think of them as governors or administrators over certain regions or or we might think of them over certain counties or provinces of the kingdom. 
And so these 120 over the whole kingdom. And then over these 120, there's three governors of whom Daniel was one of those three. That the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. So basically, Daniel is one of the three governors who were really in charge of making sure, a lot of this would have been making sure that the taxes were reported accurately. You are basically in charge of the flow of resources, either coming from the king, going to the provinces, or coming out of the provinces, coming to the king. A lot of responsibility with this position, a position where, as we well know when it comes to government, when there's a lot of money somewhere, there tends to also be a lot of corruption. But what we find out about Daniel is while likely, even in this government, much as in our governments even today, there's corruption. Verse 3, then this Daniel distinguished himself above the other governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. See, the king, Daniel was someone that the king trusted so much that the king was considering restructuring the, the government, basically. Or it had been, you had the king, and then these three governors, and then these 120 officials. What the king is thinking about doing is having these 120, and then these three governors, and then instead of the king, it would be then Daniel, and then the king. He's going to change the way things are done because he trusts Daniel so much. Now you think about restructuring governments and how that can create envy in some and how that can create jealousy in some. They want that position of power, but the king is thinking about giving that position to Daniel. So verse 4, probably the very thing that we would assume would happen is what happened. So the governors and the satraps, they sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Isn't that the way it works in governments today? You want someone out of office, you want to get rid of this government official, just do a little bit of digging, find some, something they've been involved in that they shouldn't have been involved in, dig up a little bit of dirt on them. Hey, they, they accepted this bribe under the table and you can have them out of office in a heartbeat. They did that with Daniel. They search to find something, some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Well, is there ever a time where Daniel has, has, has scraped a little bit off the top of this tax payment that came through? Was there ever a time where the king was sending resources to some province and, and you know, Daniel took a little bit of a, of a handling fee off the top of that? And they searched, but they could find no charge or fault. Because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Daniel was completely honest and faithful and trustworthy in the way that he conducted himself day in and day out on the job. And I know we're thinking about prayer tonight, but it's important for us to think about this important point here. People were searching for a, a reason, an excuse to get rid of Daniel. And they thought, well, surely. You know, as we often think, most government officials are corrupt. It seems they thought the same thing we do. And that, so they went looking into Daniel, and they could find nothing. I think even today, most people assume, you know, well, everybody's got something they're doing they shouldn't be doing. On the job, everybody's doing something, kind of, you know, that's the way business goes. You know, if you have to, if you have to fudge a little bit on this report or on that, you know, that's just the way business works. But Daniel showed, as a servant of God, he wasn't doing any of that. He was doing everything exactly the way it should have been done. And what a lesson for us today, whether on the job, at school, whatever the case may be. If someone were to look into the way that we that we do our job day in and day out, the way that we, the, the way that we, as far as a student at school, do we study as we should? Are we honest when it comes to taking tests and turning in assignments and those things? What they should find in a servant of God is 
They are doing everything exactly as it should be done. That they are faithful. They're trustworthy. You can trust that they are doing this the right way. And so, after they went through all that, they said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And so, these governors and satraps, they thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, and advisors, they consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make it a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter, which doesn't change. So therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. They knew something about Daniel. We're going to find out as we move into this next section. They knew that Daniel was someone who prayed to God every single day. This was common knowledge about Daniel. They knew Daniel prays to his God every single day. So what we'll do to trip Daniel up is we'll create a law that we know Daniel won't obey because we know he is faithful and he is devoted to his God. And we know he prays to his God every single day. So as we think about we are better together when we are people of prayer, verse 1 through 9, not only was Daniel an honest man, a trustworthy individual, but Daniel was known, even by his enemies, Daniel was known as a man of prayer because the way they go about tripping up Daniel, trying to trap Daniel, hinges upon Daniel praying to God as he should. If Daniel decides, I'm, not, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna slow down the prayer life here for the next month or so while this law is in place, then their plan falls through. They put this law into place knowing Daniel could be counted on to be faithful to God. His enemies knew that about Daniel. So as we think about us. And we're better together when we're people of prayer. Do people, those who are our friends and perhaps those who are not our friends, do they know us primarily as a people who are devoted to God and devoted to prayer? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, when Paul was writing to the church there at Thessalonica, he told them in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through verse 18, he told them, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Prayer is to, it's not that every waking moment of every single day they were in prayer, but it's prayer is actively and continually a part of your life. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Prayer is supposed to be a, 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 as much a part of a Christian's life as the air that we breathe, as the food that we eat. Prayer is supposed to be something that sustains us every single day as a Christian. Do the people that we know, whether they're our friends or not so much our friends, do they know us in the way that Daniel's enemies knew him? We are better together when we are known as people who pray, people who will remain faithful to God no matter what. But then moving on in Daniel 6, verse 10 through 17, we're going to notice that Daniel's commitment to prayer, we've already touched on this a little bit, Daniel's commitment to prayer did not change with the circumstances. Verse 10, so when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, this is Put into law, and the law of the Medes and the Persians was of such that once something was 
was signed into law, you could not change it. We're going to notice that here in a moment. Not even the king, once he has signed a law that goes into effect, not even the king can take it off the books. That was a, a, a feature of the law of the Medes and the Persians. Once a law is passed, once a law is put in place, you cannot change it. Not even the king. So when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, and, and there's going to be no appeal for this, you know, there's no, like sometimes in governments today, maybe something will be passed and there'll be an appeal process. And Dan, this is in writing. This is, this is law. This is the law of the land now. He went home. And in his upper room, with the windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Since Daniel had been a young man in Babylon, every day, three times every day, he would go to this room of his house, open up his windows in the direction toward Jerusalem, towards the temple, and he would pray three times every day. And he did that day after day after day in Babylonian captivity, a place where many of the Jews were wondering and questioning, has God forgotten us? And day after day, Daniel continues to pray. And these men knew this because they assembled together and they found Daniel praying and making supplications before his God just like they knew. Because this was Daniel's custom and had been probably many of these men ever since they had known Daniel. Daniel's, remember, an older man. They've known Daniel ever since they've maybe been in the kingdom. And they have always known this to be true of Daniel. Daniel always, at this time of day, he cuts out and he walks back to his house and, and he goes up and he prays and then he'll be back in a few minutes. They knew this about him and they knew you know, whatever time it would have been, let's say it was 9 o'clock in the morning. At 9 o'clock, Daniel's going to walk out the door, and he'll be back in a few minutes. And they knew what Daniel was going to do. And so on this morning, the next day, they, they passed this law, and sure enough, Daniel goes home just like he's always done every single day. And they found him praying. They went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree? That every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which doesn't alter, which does not change. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel was one of the captives from Judah. And by the way, going through this book, that, that little subtle insult, that little dig is always there in just about every single chapter. Someone is reminding either Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or reminding the king or someone, hey, these are the captives. These are people that we captured and brought out of their homeland. These are, these are people we have conquered. And even here, Daniel was one of the captives, one of those people that was conquered from Judah. He does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed. But makes his petition three times a day. He does not respect you. And the king, when he heard these words, and this has always interested me, was greatly displeased with himself. See, even Darius, in this moment, it struck him. Even the king knew. Daniel goes home and he prays three times a day to his God. Even the king of the Medes and the Persians knew this. And he's displeased with himself because he realizes he has been tricked and he has been trapped. Because had he been thinking clearly, he would have remembered, wait a second, Daniel, Daniel will never obey this decree, would never obey this law. Because Daniel, Daniel is faithful to his God and he always prays to his God. Even the king knew this about Daniel. 
And so the king is not upset with Daniel in the least, but he's upset with himself for falling for this. And he sent his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored to the going down of the sun to deliver him. Whatever the king had on his plate, you think about a ruler, a king, there are many important things coming before the king on a daily basis. Thinking about you know, the president of the United States of America. Think about how many things come before the president of the United States of America that are important, that demand immediate attention. I, I've read different books about past presidents before, and it's amazing. All these important decisions and all these important meetings, and you think, wow, this is incredibly important. And it's a 10-minute meeting, or it's a 15-minute meeting. Why? Because they've got 50 other of those meetings that day. He had all that, and he essentially sets everything aside, and he focuses on this for the rest of the day. He clears his schedule to try to figure out a way to deliver Daniel. And yet these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute that the king establishes may be changed. And so the king, realizing that there is nothing he can do at this point. They brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions, but the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet of his lord, so that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. They, they placed a seal on the cover of this lion's den so that everyone would know, hey, nobody has removed the stone to try to rescue Daniel. The, 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 the lords would know the king didn't try to deliver him. Nobody was going to be able to go in and get Daniel out without somebody knowing the seal has been broken. And so, Daniel's commitment to prayer did not change with the circumstances, even when it was against the law of the land. Daniel continued to pray just as he always had done. You know, we think about this and we think, well, you know, surely Daniel could have just, you know, surely he had a, an interior room of the house. You know, surely he could have prayed to God, but he could have done so in a place where nobody would have seen him. And then, hey, you know, everybody's happy at that point. Daniel could have prayed in a more private place, but since he had always prayed in this way. Remember the text told us he had done this since he was a young man. Everybody knew this is what Daniel does. Had Daniel changed that, then he would have been compromising. He would have compromised his faith had he changed what he was doing in that moment. When we think about us today, are we known as a people who are devoted to God, who are known to be people who are devoted to praying to God, perhaps even during challenging situations and troubling circumstances. I think about an instance in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 4, when, when the church, when the Christians are told, and the apostles are told, you cannot preach in the name of Jesus Christ anymore. And the apostles, they, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 23, they were let go and they went to their own companions, they went back to the church, and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And what they do is they pray. They go back to the church. They have been told, you cannot preach anymore in the name of Jesus Christ. They go back to the church, and they pray, and then after they are through praying, they keep on. They pray, they put it in the hands of God. In fact, really all they say to God is they praise God for who he is and how great he is. And then they say, Lord, see their threats. Daniel. In verse 18 through verse 23, Daniel's commitment to prayer demonstrated his faith in God. His commitment to prayer showed his faith in God. So verse 18 the king goes back to his palace. He spends the night fasting. The musicians were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. 
The king goes back to the palace and spends a sleepless night worried and anxious over Daniel. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of the lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice, with a, with a sorrowful voice, a grieving voice. And the king spoke, saying to Daniel, the fact that it mentions that Darius' voice was sorrowful, it seems as if Darius is hopeful that Daniel's God has delivered him. But it doesn't seem to say, maybe as we would say, his money wasn't on that. The, Darius was not banking on Daniel having been delivered. He was hopeful. But to cry out with a sorrowful voice, the only reason you would be sorrowful in this moment is because you are concerned about what you believe the lions have done to Daniel that night. He's hopeful, but he doesn't seem to be overly confident in this situation. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. Daniel was delivered, the text tells us, because he was found innocent before God. God considered the situation and said, Daniel is innocent of all wrongdoing in this instance. Daniel, the text also says, was delivered because he had believed in his God. Daniel's, uh, up to this point then, putting these pieces together, Daniel's commitment to prayer, even in the face of knowing the consequences, his commitment to prayer demonstrated his innocence and his faith in God. The fact that Daniel continued to pray even though he knew what that meant for him physically. He knew, I will be caught and I will be thrown into the den of lions. Even knowing that, continuing to pray, God says, you are innocent of all wrongdoing. And Daniel believed in his God. And so we think about us. What is our commitment? Or perhaps, hopefully not, but perhaps our lack of commitment to prayer. What does that say about our faith in God? When it comes to Daniel, God says his commitment to prayer demonstrated that he believed in his God and demonstrated his faith and his innocence before God. See, really, partially what prayer does is prayer is a, it is a demonstration of do we believe God? Do we really truly believe in God? Believe in his power? Believe that he hears us? Believe that he can answer our prayers? Prayer is sort of a, a, a testing ground for that, for us. It's sort of a demonstration. Where are we when it comes to our faith in the God of heaven. For Daniel, it demonstrated he's innocent and he believes in God. And then finally, verse 24 through verse 28, when we pray, let us remember who it is we are approaching. And so the king gives the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. In other words, partially this is showing that it wasn't that the lions didn't hurt Daniel because they weren't hungry. What it's demonstrating is the only reason the lions didn't hurt Daniel was because God prevented them from doing so because you put other people in there and they're torn to pieces before they ever even get to the bottom of that den. 
God, what that verse is showing is there's not a doubt in anyone's mind. The only reason that Daniel came out of that den alive and without a scratch is because God protected him. And then, after all that, verse 25, then King Darius wrote, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Much like in Daniel 4, when Nebuchadnezzar sent out a proclamation to his whole nation, King Darius does the same thing here. He says, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. And he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. When we pray, as, as Darius declares here, when we pray, we need to remember who it is we are approaching. We are, when we pray, we are approaching in prayer the living God who is steadfast forever, the living God who does not change. We are pro approaching the living God who is eternal. When we come before God in prayer, we are approaching the great I am, the one who has always been and always will be. When we pray, remember that we are approaching God, the one with the indestructible kingdom, the one with the kingdom without end that endures to the end. We're approaching the most powerful being that we could ever comprehend. And really, his power is even beyond what we can imagine. We are approaching someone more powerful than even we can picture in our minds. When we pray, let's remember that we are approaching the God who delivers and the God who rescues. We are approaching the God who saves with unmatchable power. Prayer is really calling upon the almighty sovereign God. Often, in the Psalms especially, prayer is simply calling out to God to act in accordance with his will. Oftentimes, in Psalms, David will write something along the lines of, of protect me, don't leave me. Even though he knows God is not going to do that, what is he doing? He's not doubting God. But he's simply calling out to God to do what God has already promised he will do. It's trusting God, putting his faith in God. Sometimes, if we're not careful, we treat prayer as a, as a last resort. You know, we face some problem, we face some difficulty, and we try everything in the world. And then, after all of that, well, all there's left to do now is just pray. As if there was ever anything else we could do that was any better than that. When we think about prayer, too often we treat prayer as our last resort when it should really, prayer is our first resort. When you face difficult things in your life, whether it be at school, whether it be on the job, whether it be with your family, with neighbors, whatever, with your health, don't treat prayer as the last line of defense. Treat it as the first thing you do when you get that news, whatever that may be. Prayer, let it be the first thing that we do. Just like Daniel, we are better together when we are a people of prayer. Now, being a people of prayer does not mean that nothing bad will ever happen to us. You read through, as we've gone through the book of Daniel this week, there's been some pretty bad things that have happened to these young men and older men that we've read about this week. Life was not completely smooth for them. They faced plenty of difficulties. But being a people of prayer means that no matter what we face, we continue to trust 
and rely upon God during those times. We are better together when we are a people of prayer. It's interesting that at the end of what Darius said there, as we think about extending the invitation tonight, Darius mentioned God's kingdom which shall not be destroyed. That kingdom that Darius referenced at the end of Daniel 6, that kingdom is here today. That kingdom is Jesus' church, is the church of Jesus Christ. That is the kingdom that Darius is referencing. And you can be a part of God's kingdom today. Isaiah wrote about it in Isaiah chapter 2. Daniel, we already read that back in Daniel 2 verse 44. You get to Acts chapter 2 and you realize the kingdom that God has been planning, the kingdom that God has been promising all through the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 2, Peter refers to Joel 2 and he says, that time, this is it. And so, knowing that Jesus is the Lord and the Christ, he is the king of this kingdom. Knowing that he has been crucified and he has died for you, what we ought to do then is to repent of our sins and be baptized, be buried with them in baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. And those who do that, the end of that chapter says, the Lord adds them to his church, to his kingdom. Tonight you can do that very thing and be added by the Lord to his kingdom tonight. If you are a Christian and you realize that as we think about prayer tonight, that prayer has not been much a part of your life at all. It's something that's supposed to be our lifeline as Christians. It's something that's supposed to be a constant part of who we are. You realize that you have not been trusting God as you should tonight. You can make that right as well. If you do need to respond, why don't you come as we stand and as we sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, joined by the world's